Welcome to the Malachi's Message Foundation and its Toxic Mold Suck Stories, where we want people to know that toxic mold is a real danger and threat to not only your health, but your home, your finances, and your relationships. We want to raise awareness about toxic mold by showing you the real damage it does to the people, families, and children it affects, and the process they go through after being impacted by mold in order to regain their health, their home, and their lives back. Today we are joined by Jennifer Carpenter, who is going to share with us her family's mold story. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Thank you for, for coming on. I, uh, she can hear you, and so she thinks that you're here. No, 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 no baby, come here. Come here, no, no. Come here, sit, sit, sit by me. It's just me. Come on. Okay, sorry about that interruption. Okay. Um, can you first tell us a little bit about, you know, what your life looked like before mold? Sure, yeah. So I can, my exposure to mold or my family's exposure to mold and kind of the start of my family converged at a really similar time, which made it hard too, because when you're, just moving in with somebody and things like that. You don't really know what normal is yet. And um, so when I speak about my life before mold, it's going to kind of have to be really just focused on myself. Yeah, that's fine. But what I would say about my life before mold was just the, like the ability that I had, you know, just to be active all the time. Um, you know, I worked out all the time. I had run marathons and I did CrossFit and, you know, I worked a full-time job and um, I, I was always moving, 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 moving. Um, so, you know, getting such terrible chronic fatigue where unloading the dishwasher became a chore that required like a little nap afterwards. Um, obviously it was literally like a complete 180 for me. And, you know, I was very young also as well. So I would say like the biggest thing um, when I think about what I you know, what life was like before that was just my health was, you know, I think what people considered normal, right? I could, I could do things and not think about it. I could leave the house and it wasn't like a major production. I could just decide I need to go somewhere and I could go. <laughs> that probably sounds ridiculous to most people, but I think those of us who have been in moldy homes and understand what's happening probably that resonates a lot because for some reason, and even still to this day, although I, you know, we're all doing much better. Um, it's still hard as heck to leave the house sometimes. So it was easy to leave the house. I could do a lot. I could work out a lot and it was just normal. It was something I definitely took for granted. Yeah. I think a lot of people go, that go through it can understand exactly what you just meant. Um, now can you, now, might be a little bit hard, but can you share with us your mold journey or your mold story? Sure. Um, so now looking back, I can see that I was in moldy places, apartments for sure, you know, several times while I lived here in Houston. Um, but the discovery was made when we, when I moved in with my now husband, we were about to get married. He had, he just bought the house a year before we got married. And um, I moved in about six months before we got married. And right upon moving in, um, I started to have weird health things pop up. Like I got strep throat for the first time at 32, 32 years old. So that's not very common. Usually it's kiddos that get things like strep throat. And um, it was really weird to me. And then I also started getting really nagging pain in like my lower back and it would shoot down like my leg. And um, so I thought at first, oh, well, I'm working out too hard and um, slowly just cut back on the working out till I wasn't working out at all. Um, and I was seeing a, uh, what are you doing about? Oh, it's my Lucy, it's my little Lucy poodle. Um, she, uh, that I was seeing a chiropractor for months and months um, to try to get better. And 
she recommended after a few months of not getting better and progressively just getting worse that I go get an MRI. And, you know, that led to, oh, you have, you know, herniated discs and all these other excuses about why I would be having this pain. So, you know, that's what I, what I believed. And at the same time um, that happened, I, I was just getting all these other symptoms. And also when I look back before my husband bought that house, he and I never fought. We ever did. And then I really, I can look back and I can say like, right after he moved in, there was like a shift in our relationship. And I think at the time I thought, well, I guess like the newness is worn off or whatever, but I, but now I believe that like, it was kind of, you know, some mold rage and it was how it was impacting him from the very beginning. I was picking up on that and taking it and not understanding. Obviously I didn't understand that. So I was, you know, taking, personalizing it and thinking it was about our relationship when it probably really was just the way his body was initially neurologically responding to the mold. Um, but we had no idea, no idea at all. We lived, you know, in a really nice house um, here in the back of the woodlands in Sterling Ridge. And uh, it was well kept and well cared for. Um, you know, we had maids that came and, you know, it was, it was a really beautiful house that you would never, I mean, it didn't even cross our minds. And we had heard of black toxic mold before. Um, but everything we thought we knew about it was wrong. Everything. Like we thought, oh, well, if you have that, you know, you have that, like you can see it or you can smell it. Right. I mean, um, we, we really had no idea and everything that we thought we knew was just completely, completely wrong. So, um, basically, you know, at 32, I just kind of fell apart as the time went on there. Um, I ended up getting such, my back ended up getting so bad that I had to have three spinal injections back to back to back to back. And that just kind of wreaked total havoc on my body. Ended up on um, pain, uh, opioid pain medication long-term to basically just be able to function normally as like a young 30, young girl in, in your thirties. Uh, my period, stopped coming and, and nobody could figure out why I didn't have my period for like three years. Um, I had a symptom list about 40 items long by the time we figured it all out, but um, it included everything from, you know, insomnia to metallic. I remember having an awful metallic taste in my mouth all the time. Um, an air hunger. I would like not be able to get a breath a lot, which was super weird. Uh, awful nausea, like you know, I had really bad stomach pain. I remember sometimes I would just get awful pains in my stomach, like I had an ulcer or something. Um, you know, the people can look at the list and I feel like I had nearly everything on it. Um, and we would have never figured it out ever. Everyone in my family ended up getting an autoimmune condition except for one, um, our oldest son. He, he experienced headaches and uh, spontaneous nosebleeds very frequently. Um, but all the rest of us did. My husband got ITP, which is um, where the body starts attacking the platelets. And luckily he has never got, I think the lowest that he ever had was around 80. The bottom number you're supposed to have is 150. Um, but people who get really, really low, like they have to go to the hospital. So in like the grand scheme of ITP, it was not terrible, but you know, it was still present. Um, I got Hashimoto's and then the other kids got uh, hands. And my husband also has tested positive for antibodies attacking his brain as well. So um, yeah, it just absolutely, annihilated my family health-wise. We were there for nearly seven years. And uh, between all of us, easily saw dozens of doctors and not a single person ever once mentioned um, that perhaps we should consider an environmental cause and maybe look into anything like a leak or something in our home that could be affecting our health ever. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, it is sad because you know so many people are still sick today and they're still going back to the doctors and being told we don't know right i mean because once you understand the scope and and just the whole message of toxicity, right? Toxic, I say now to people all the time, like the main problem with illness in your body is toxins of some kind, right? Um, it doesn't always have to be a biological toxin, like from mold or bacteria, it could be, you know, chemical or whatever, but it is toxin driven. And how do we get exposed to toxins? Well, we can eat them, we can drink them, um, we can breathe them or we can touch them, right? So what are you doing more frequently than any of those? I mean, way more frequently than eating or drinking. We are breathing air. And most of that time we're in our homes. So most of the time the air we're breathing is in our homes. And, um, you know, I hope that that can resonate with some people so that they can understand that if they're going to take anything seriously, if they're going to, you know, worry about eating organic and, all of that making in the healthy food, I hope they'll also invest in making sure that the air that they're breathing is, is good for them because you can't eat your way out of or supplement your way out of bad air. And a simple way for people to kind of do their own testing, which you are kind of, you help so many people with is just ordering an army. Um, yes. I'm a big, big proponent of the army. And I have to say only with Mycometrics. I know a lot of the physicians are using Envirobionics because they um, they make it a lot easier for anybody to work with them as far as like referring patients or whatever. Um, and of course they're a little bit cheaper, which is nice, but unfortunately they're not. I found, I had three, I don't work with that many people. And I had three people in like a 30 day period that had verified incorrect results from, my, from Envirobionics. So to me, if that happens, that's like lighting your money on fire, because if you can't trust those results, then it, the test means nothing, no. right? So um, Mycometrics is, you know, long as I've been using them, they've been right on. Um, I've never had any issues with them and they're a little bit more expensive, but uh, yeah, I, I am a big fan of it because as you know, well, first of all, it's a relatively, it's definitely the cheapest way to get an idea of what could be going on in your home, right? Um, and it, as long as you do things correctly, meaning that, you know, you have plenty of dust available um, and you get a good swipe everywhere in the home, um, you really should get a fairly accurate result back. And it's, you know, the whole thing is so expensive as it is, and especially for those people who, you know, maybe they are convinced that they really don't have a problem, but they're just kind of checking it off their list because they are really concerned about, you know, keeping healthy and their children healthy. It's a really cost-effective way to get that initial picture of what could be going on with them in their home. And um, what I've found is, interestingly enough, the molds that show up, they actually tend to show up in very similar places, surprisingly across the entire country. So um, I thought that there would be a lot more differences and nuances between where the molds might be in different areas. But surprisingly enough, you know, there are a couple that have, you know, maybe a spot or two that are different uh, if you're in California rather than here. But uh, for the most part, a lot of them are pretty much typically found in the same place. And of course, the big one that I know you guys are um, super on top of and probably one of the only people that are on top of it is, is the negative air pressure molds that are popping up from, from issues with you know not having that attic plate sealed and just not having the HVAC done correctly and causing negative air pressure to actually you know, pull in humid, hot air from an attic and then push it into your home along with all of the biotoxins that are in those humid spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that very well on an army. After, after you got out of mold, how, I guess, how did mold change your life moving forward? Ooh. <laughs> That is a majorly loaded question. Um, 
because we had a really hard time. Um, our little girl had a, the way we discovered our problem was when our, uh, my two-year-old, she was waking up and she'd always had issues that a lot, that strangely a lot of people didn't see. Um, but she started waking up when she was almost two and a half, like she was possessed by a demon and saying, I hate you. And like, honestly, like, like, uh, exorcist stuff. It was really scary. And so of course any mother will be like, okay, this is definitely not normal. And we went to the doctor and luckily by that point, I had found a wonderful doctor and Dr. Paula Krupstadt. And so, um, she listened to my concern, which sadly is not something that many of the pediatricians these days do and, um, acted on it and said, okay, so let's take out our tonsils and let's do it right away. And so we immediately scheduled for her tonsils to come out and we, she went ahead and did a test for the antibodies to, to test for pandas actually, because that's, I didn't know about pants at the time. I only knew about pandas and, um, what we ended up discovering after we left the house was just how much our daughter had been impacted because it was like, it was very bittersweet. It was like meeting our kid for the first time. And I honestly had thought before that I just kind of had an ornery, excuse the language, I say I'm just kind of an asshole for a kid. <laughs> but what I discovered is that she's actually the sweetest, you know, she was just the sweetest little girl ever, like exactly what she would think, like the poem, right? Um, about little girls is that's who she really was. And she really had a demeanor of like wanting to please me and just, she was just totally different um, outside of the mold. And then any impact with um, biotoxins and you could see the flare and especially at first, they were so extreme and so scary. Like she could uh, lose her ability to talk where she just seemed like completely drunk and out of it. She would have memory glitches. And, and honestly, it could be, it could have been seizures. I, I don't know, but um, where she would almost like 51st states, but it would be like on a, every 60 seconds interval instead of, you know, 24 hours where she would ask me the same question over and over and over again. And she had actually done that in our home as well. Um, and I had remember feeling so bad when I recognized it as a major flare sign because um, I had always been very aggravated with her when she had done that in the home, thinking that she was just wanting attention and trying to be bothersome. But really, she literally could not remember what had just happened. So she was asking the same exact question again. It was like she was stuck in a loop or something. Um, things like that, all the way to extremely rage and um, the opposite spectrum, which would be like extreme, extreme anxiety, where she was terrified to leave the room, to talk to anybody or to even be near anybody that wasn't me, uh, including her father, really. So um, these, you know, and for a really social, outgoing little girl, these were, these are obviously devastating things to watch happen to your not even three-year-old. Um, so of course that mama bear kicked in and, you know, we ended up testing all of our relatives homes that we had frequently went to like our parents. And of course, both of them had super high levels of the same molds that had impacted our house at high levels, which was the Stachybotrys chartum and the Aspergillus penicillium. And so, you know, we discovered you know, she couldn't go there. And because she was so incredibly sensitive, not only could she not go there, but she couldn't even be, she couldn't even go around them if they didn't take showers and change their clothes. Um, and this did not go over well with any of these people. It really impacted a lot of the relationships that we had too, because what we discovered, what I discovered was that places that she had been going and people that she had been around a lot, she would have these outrageous flares around, I think because her body had become so sensitized to any of the biotoxins that she was around while living in our home. Um, 
it was just too difficult really for her to be around any of any of uh, the people that she normally had been. And um, even my husband's work, he, when we got out of the house and I mean, we, I wasn't taking any chances. So we sold our cars. Um, well, that one, when we first got into my car again, after leaving the house, we were in it for five minutes. And then we got out and I realized, oh my God, I feel horrible. I have a headache and I had a so nauseous. My stomach felt terrible. And then I started watching Caitlin and she starts flaring. And I think, oh my goodness, that was just from five minutes in my car after like a 72 hour sabbatical, basically away from everything. And um, so we ended up getting new cars, new, new everything. And then, so we're out and we finally found an apartment. That's a whole different saga of, of how many houses we had to look at and all the things for the apartments and whatever we'll skip that we'll leave that for the people who want to read the book <laughs> but um you know in the new apartment when when I was living with my husband again because for a short time I was staying with my sister and her family we were very very blessed that they had just recently uh, redone their home because they got like an inch of water two inches of water for Harvey so they had just recently remodeled, they decided to take the opportunity to remodel and they had like completely remodeled the whole downstairs. So um, their home, very luckily for us, ended up being safe and a place that we both did well. So my husband wasn't with us for about three weeks. So when we got at an apartment finally and all um, were back together, um, when he would come home from work, Caitlin would immediately, like within 10 minutes or less, have awful diarrhea and she would start to flare and on the weekend she wouldn't do that around him she would be fine and so I had to tell my husband for like a month there's something going on at your office there's something going on at your office she's fine all day until you come home and he was really puzzled by this because I mean if you saw our decontamination uh set up it was it's really it was ridiculous honestly but I mean this is what you have to do when you get impacted by stuff like this. Um, we had a tent that had like a special spray in the little garage area and he would take off all of his clothes, put him in a bag before we would put him in the laundry room. And then he would immediately go and take a shower, wash, scrub everything, and then put on new clothes that had never been anywhere and, and should be fine. And yet this would happen. Um, and really it was, she was so sensitive that after him being in that environment for eight or 10 hours or whatever, you know, you do the majority of your detoxing through your skin and through your breath. And so he would be detoxing from that exposure all day long. And she was so sensitive that that would set her off. So you, incredible flares. Um, so finally, after a month of me nagging him, he would, he, he went and we did an ERMI and the ERMI showed that his office had an Aspergillus penicillium score of 3000 on an ERMI. That's incredibly high, a score of 3000 on an ERMI. And also um, he had a bunch of other stuff too, but you know, he had, what, what they discovered was that there was a sprinkler head outside that had broken and was shooting like a hard beam of water at the building at the, and God knows for how long that had been going on right? Because we put the sprinklers on at night. And so it had penetrated the building and the whole conference room, the whole wall of the conference room, the floor of the conference room was a major problem. Oh, wow. It was like, it was basically everywhere, everywhere. And people don't uh, take it very well when you tell them things like your house has too many biotoxins or my child or us to go to, you know, unfortunately, because it's not about cleanliness. It's not about upkeep. It's not about how nice your home is. Mold doesn't care. It's not about any of those things, you know? So it's unfortunate that people respond that way, but they do. So it really impacted your relationships with family and friends? In a major, major way. Yeah. Major way. And in some instances, those relationships have yet to recover, really, and may, might not ever. 
Um, so my husband ended up uh, leaving his family business. Um, his family was very, very put out about having to remediate his office and they chose not to do it the right way and didn't follow um, instructions. And so after they spent the money on doing everything for the building, they brought back all of the same equipment without having anything done to it whatsoever. And so they just recontaminated it again. And of course, um, Kate, Caitlin was doing okay for like two weeks after they did the remediation. And then after that, she started doing it again when he came home. And that's how I discovered that they had never done anything with any of the office equipment, like any of the electronics or desks or furniture or anything. So it just basically took a couple of weeks for all of that to build back up to a level that my daughter responded to. So he ended up not being able to work at that office anymore after that was discovered and just caused a lot of problems. So yeah, it's, in fact, I would almost say that the isolation of going through something like this that nobody understands and in many cases doesn't really believe is as big of a deal as you're making it um, is almost the most difficult thing about mold. It's, it's almost harder than, than the illness. Mm -hmm. Bearable, really. I mean, because you're so sick. You really are. Um, and then, of course, the dealing with sick children, be, not, not being 100% yourself and then having to deal with you know, children who are, and many times what you see in children is just major behavioral issues, you know? And in fact, that is what breaks my heart the most when I look around the communities and the, and the kids and you see, or you hear the stories on TV about kids who just all of a sudden, you know, go wackadoodle. It's like, you can almost be certain that it was a biotoxin exposure or, or a chronic biotoxin issue that's causing these problems. And it, it's just, it's really heartbreaking. I can understand that. Um, yeah. Everybody needs to think mold if their child's behavior starts to get out of hand, if they're impacted, if they're Don't starting listen to listen to any of the excuses that the physicians will make these days, because they will literally give you an excuse for anything and everything that is happening with your kid. Oh, oh, that's normal, that's normal. It's not normal for kids to be sick every time, all, all the time. It's not normal for them to catch every little thing. It's not. It's not normal for them to have ear infections every other day, prone to, no, you're prone to it because your body is sensitive to biotoxins. You don't, if you're prone to ear infections and sinus infections as a child, it's because your body is sensitive to biotoxins and there are too many biotoxins in your air, period. Like a hundred percent. Um, any of the like oppositional defiant disorders, mold, hundred percent think mold. Um, like in my, like in my sense, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit disorder. How long has everybody been talking about like all the kids being on Adderall and Ritalin and stuff like that? Well, yeah, because that's one of the, that was one of Caitlin's earliest signs was when she started to be like, vroom, 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 and not able to focus on everything. That was one of her low level flare symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the first thing that happens to kids when they're being exposed to biotoxins is that inability to focus and concentrate and just that need to move and like the zoomies, if you will. Like, um, yeah, I mean, kids sadly are being incredibly in impacted by mm -hmm. biotoxins because I, I don't know, well, Personally, I think it's because of the building standards and how they've changed in the last 20 years and why we're seeing such a huge impact on today's youth as far as bio biotoxins go. I mean, I know I can look back. I, I got ear infections constantly as a kid, so I can look back and I know that I was living, you know, in some moldy places. Um, but as an overall population, like what we're seeing with the ADHD and the behavioral disorders, um, not to mention, of course, the flashing red lights of the autism diagnoses and uh, the increasing rates of asthma and, and childhood diabetes, childhood obesity, 
I mean, I think mold is a big player in childhood obesity because it just completely knocks out your body's ability to sensitize to insulin, right? Because it just destroys all of your hormones. Mm -hmm. So it's messing with your insulin, it's messing with your leptin. And of course, you know, so I could go on and on, but I think it's because of the building standards, how tight we're building today. Um, these homes can't breathe and we're using the absolute worst materials. And here in Texas, of course, we have that perfect storm of zero building regulations whatsoever. And I'm a conservative, I hate regulations, but it makes no sense that you have to have a license to take somebody fishing or to do somebody's nails. And you don't have to have a license to build somebody's house. You have to have insurance to do all of these things but you don't have to have insurance to build somebody's house or build somebody a commercial building. Nope. That's just like a free, you know, do whatever you want, I guess, really. The law protects them more than it protects the people that are buying the properties. And um, the materials that we're using are, you know, completely not appropriate for this climate here in Texas. We shouldn't be using materials that can be affected by humidity and leaving them in environments that are not climatized. I mean, you, we know what's going to happen. We know that mold thrives above 60% humidity, which we have nearly daily outside here. Um, and that's without any water leaks. And those are gonna happen. Um, we should be putting, we should be making use of technology by putting monitors in bathrooms and places where pipes are that will go off. So if there is a leak, you know, we, but we don't do any of those things because they'll make building more expensive. So what we have is um, builders making great profits and putting people in very unsafe homes. And you, you would know that because um, your husband has a cool, I mean, y'all have just this amazing story, but your husband now it went back into law and he's helping people that are going through builder nightmares or mold nightmares and yes because he's doing great yeah and and he's really passionate about it and <laughs> he says all the time like on certain cases man i'll just i'll do the, i'll see this builder for free um because he has quite a bit of resentment for these builders who they are just um careless and reckless they um are completely negligent and in many cases, they're absolutely, they're defrauding people. They're defrauding people because they're not, they're providing a uh, inferior product that they know is inferior and they're doing it to make money, to increase their bottom line, especially these really big production builders. Um, every, so one of our experts, because we're currently suing our builder at the house that I'm in right now, um, one of our experts likes to say that if a builder can make five more dollars, uh, that they'll they'll do anything just to add five dollars profit to to their house. And it when you really look at some of the just absolutely ridiculous things that that they do, it, it seems to be true. So I know we can talk about that all day long. We have to do a separate show. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> do a separate show for that. Next question. Other Mike, I have like five mold stories, really, you know, but I'm just focusing on the one, the main one, the main one that made us, that set us over the edge and uh, made us aware, made us aware. The next question I have is um, whenever you found out it was mold, how did that make you feel? Causing all these issues that for years you couldn't diagnose properly. So this is a great question because um, I think about this sometimes and I think, am I still glad or not? And, and I think the answer is I'm still glad. So I had been searching for so long to figure out what in the hell was wrong with me because I used to tell people all the time, maybe, you know, how people say, oh, how are you or whatever? And, you know, oh, I'm good. So I'd say, oh, I'm just dragging my dead body around. Right. And I'd kind of, you know, be kind of cheerful and jokey about it. But that is how I felt for years. And this is in my 30s, right? I mean, this started at 32 and went to 38, I guess. Um, I should have been 
not feeling like I was a hundred years old and dead. And I, that's really what I felt like, honestly, I felt like I was um, a walking dead person and not really walking, but kind of just dragging this dead body of mine around. And um, I was constantly trying to figure out what in the world was wrong because, you know, by, by the time we figured this out, I had even stopped going to all of my physicians because I had so many specialists. You know, they make you see a different person for your finger, then your toe, then your nose, right? So, I mean, all of my time away from my daughter was usually spent. I usually had like three doctor's appointments a week, different doctors. It was it was crazy, and I never was getting any better. Like in fact, I was only getting worse. Um, so I was like, screw it. I just stopped going for to all of them for uh, a long time. And so when I finally, when I finally realized because of my daughter's test, her pants and pandas test that came back positive and it said, that's how I found out about pans. It was like, oh, okay, so this is pandas. It's the strep throat bacteria, but here are seven or eight other things that cause the same thing, but we call that pans. I went down that list and I saw mycotoxins right away. And I thought, this is a real thought that I had. Oh, it's not mycotoxins. I didn't know what mycotoxins were. So I was like, oh, it's not that. I mean, that's the height of ignorance, right? But when I had gone through all the others and none of those were correct, I looked back at mycotoxins and kind of looked it up and went, oh, and then that made me look some more about myco now I had this word that I could put into the computer right mycotoxin poisoning or mold toxicity right I started to find the buzzwords that were actually going to get google results because believe it or not I was the um google symptom queen like just the digging that I did trying to figure out what was wrong with me was unbelievable and never once did anything environmental even pop up on my computer I mean, that is unbelievable to me because we're not talking about just looking at first page results, you know, it, it just seems, it just seems not possible without intent, <laughs> to be honest. It almost, it feels like it was hidden. I feel like I had to put in very specific verbiage. And once I had that verbiage, it was on fire. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I remember thinking, holy cow, this has to be it. Because not only does this des describe Caitlin's health history to a T, but also myself, my husband, our boys, it, it fit everybody perfectly. So I knew before Josh came that it was going to come back positive. I knew it. Um, and, you know, sure enough, it did. So when I got that, I was happy, actually. I was happy. I was encouraged because I felt like, since we knew what was going on with Caitlin, we could, we could help her get better. I think I was maybe a little more encouraged than I should have been. <laughs> I didn't have any idea how hard it was going to be. Um, and I uh, didn't realize, I hadn't really wrapped my brain around, I guess, what an autoimmune condition means. Because, you know, as you know, we, the, the human body, um, the immune system of the human body is the most amazing and advanced warfare system known to man. And we don't have a freaking clue really about 98% of how it works. So we are just not capable of resetting it at this point. Um, but God is here, he's for us and he is good. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not counting out that we can't reset them. I'm just saying, you know, as a, as a culture, man does not know how to do that yet. So I, I was a little more optimistic about that than I, than I should have been probably at the time, but I'm still very happy um, that we know because if we didn't know, I don't even want to think about what that would look like. Um. The one question, um, you know, cause this is the first nonprofit, you know, set up to financially assist those going through mold. 
because the number one hurdle for everybody that goes through mold is money. You know, um, the doctors that can treat you for mold and test you for mold generally don't take any insurance. So it's if all you can't even money. find a doctor and get in with a doctor who understands anything about it, quite yeah. honestly, I mean, that's the biggest hurdle um, for a lot of people, I think, you know? Oh, yeah. Lucky here in this area because we just happen to have someone like Dr. Krupstadt at Hope for Healing who um, listens to her patients, mm-hmm. patients, and then didn't didn't she checked whatever preconceived notions she had about mold toxicity at the door, and she was open minded and she saw a pattern, and then she realized, holy cow, like you know, look what's, look what's happening here. Um, so we were lucky here in this area, but I think a lot of areas aren't that lucky. Yep. And then if it's your own home, so even if they could afford it. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Krep said she, she doesn't take insurance, so she has to be pretty expensive, you know, um, because she doesn't take insurance and she takes her time with her patients. Like her, her quickest appointment is 30 minutes face-to-face with a patient. How many regular doctors that take insurance are spending that time? Not a single one of them. I mean, I, I think I got maybe five, maybe 10 minutes. And that's because Caitlin was always so sick that they actually had to do a lot of examining her <laughs> um, at the pediatrician's office when we were going to a regular pediatrician, you know? I mean, that's her quickest visit is 30 minutes. Usually, it takes, you know, depending on where you're at in the process, it's an hour. So, yeah, it's really expensive to, to d- good doctors are expensive. Well, if, if this foundation had been set up and available to you guys back in that time, how do you think it would have helped you guys? Um, so to be perfectly honest, Nobody wants to spend money on on this, but we have been very blessed in that we did have the money to spend. My husband did really well with his family's business. Um, He was always very responsible financially and fiscally. So, you know, we, we did have, and that was one thing that I was so grateful for the entire time um, that we actually had the resources to do what needed to be done. I mean, Quite honestly, I spent a lot of time thinking about people who, I mean, I'm not going to say who can't leave everything because yes, you can, right? When your health is that bad and when you have a little girl who's like possessed by a demon and everybody's getting autoimmunes and stuff, yes, you can leave everything regardless of how much money you have because you have to choose health over possessions. You simply have to. Um, But we were fortunate in that we could afford to replace things. We could afford to get another car you know, um, and I thought so, so many nights, you know, when I finally joined some of the mold Facebook groups online and things like that, I thought so many nights about the single moms who, um, they, it wasn't just about leaving moldy possessions. It was like, what, what, it was about way more than that for people like, you know, like that. And it just hurt my heart so much because I know for me, there is literally nothing that I wouldn't do to have saved my daughter, once I realized what was hurting her, to have saved her from what was sure to be like, I mean, if we would have continued, there's no doubt in my mind that she'd be in like a mental institution right now, which sadly is where a lot of kids with pandas and pans end up before they're, before they're diagnosed. Um, but I mean, there's no doubt that she would be because she was already super severe, you know, at two and a half. So three more years of that, she. She would have been a total lunatic. Um, I mean, I say quite on, like, I, I don't think I wouldn't have been above selling myself on the street corner, honestly, if I had to. And I do, it hurt my heart so much. So Malachi's message is, um, is very, it's a great thing. I'm so proud of you that you and Elizabeth, that you guys have done this. And it's, um, to me, it's, it's for those it's for those people. It's for those families that um, mom and dad are working. And like, this is, this is just, they, they don't have the resources to handle this because it's a lot. It's a lot. It was 
it was a real blessing from God um, that we had the resources that we had. And um, for those who can't, uh, they need more help. And there's no help out there, none at all. So I would ask anybody who's taken the time to listen to all of this, even if it's just $5, to please give something to Malachi's message today because um, these families and these children, they need the help. They really do. If there's one thing that you could tell anybody about mold, what would that be? Um, it would be that you probably don't know what you, like what you think you know about it is probably wrong, number one. So it would be whatever preconceived notions you have, definitely leave those at the door and just be completely open-minded to it. And I think if people look at, if people were able to do those easy, I mean, if you do Google searches with mycotoxin poisoning and mold toxicity, I mean, you'll come across some pretty decent information, right? I mean, if you, if you have a true searcher's heart, and um, it'll blow your mind because it is really a root cause for so much illness, truly is. And um, the good news is that it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to mean get rid of all of your stuff, sell your cars, right? I mean, what, what I've learned with my family the last three years is that there are a lot of uh, biohacks, if you will, um, that people can do. And also that there are, there are things that people should do, especially if they're living in an area like Houston or you know, Southern Louisiana, any of these like really big mold heavy hitter places, there are things that you can do to be proactive about mold. And, and I definitely would, maybe that's the number one thing I should be telling people, be proactive about it, right? Um, make sure your attic's sealed. I mean, it's not that expensive to like do a foam seal on your attic floor and make sure that negative pressure cannot happen. That's not that expensive. Um, make, make some, uh, spend a little extra money on things like HVAC and uh, making sure that you're keeping that clean and not full of mold and, and yuck. If you can't do it yourself, spend the money, excuse me, spend the money to have somebody come out and uh, check your roof and, and your property for leaks, you know, like definitely this is an area where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There, there's no doubt about that. That is some good information. Yeah, more than one thing. <laughs> one thing I love about you is, I mean, you have such a serving heart. You have, you spend so much time just talking to others who need to have an you know, an ear to listen to because they're going through mold. And just like you mentioned earlier on, it's so isolating, you know, and you just need somebody who can understand, you know, what they're going through to help encourage them not to give up. And you've also um, helped a lot of people with high tech. And now you even represent high tech because that's an amazing product that helps the indoor environment stay clean of mold and mycotoxins. And your yeah, husband. I was talking to so many people about it anyway, and there's a lot of nuances with it. There really is. Um, it's definitely not, and I tell my people this, it's not as easy as plug it in and voila, your environment's better and everybody's feeling great. Like, I wish it was that easy. However, if it were, it'd probably be way more expensive than it already is. Um, but so there are nuances with it. But, you know, you work through those nuances because it, it, you know, the reason why is, and that's another reason why mold is so tough because it's so freaking individualized, right? The molds are individualized. The person's genetics and how it responds to it is individualized. I mean, it's just so many variables that go into play. The house, what kind and all the things. It's just about as many variables as you can throw into a situation as possible. And so that always makes it really complicated. And the same thing, like, you know, when you're going to be pulling in any kind of equipment or whatever to help you with that. But I was spending so much time talking to people about that because it really was a huge game changer. Again, my daughter being so sensitive, us living in Houston, we couldn't find a place. We could not find a place to live. Like 
um, for any amount of time that my daughter could do okay. And because she became so incredibly sensitive and triggered by Aspergillus penicillium, that is what sets off her major, major flares. She gets other biological symptoms from, you know, stocky botrys or the chatomium for sure. Uh, I'm not at all suggesting that those are not, I mean, it, it may have been the presence of those that actually triggered the sensitivity to the aspergillus penicillium, but we had so much aspergillus penicillium. We had so much more of, of it because it's so easy because it's just a humidity mold that that's the species that she gets her autoimmune flare to. Um, and of course, you only have to have 60% humidity and some negative air pressure to have high levels of that. And so it's rampant here. It's, it's everywhere. And it, so because of that, the high tech made it really possible to live um, the most normal life that we, that we can. Because before it, if I even tried to explain what our decontamination policies looked like and you know what we had to do to go here or there or to take our dogs to the vet, like taking your dog to the vet, like the dog couldn't come back and tell the house then. Like, I mean, it was crazy. So yeah, spending a lot of time talking with people about that and trying to help them be successful with it. Um, and so that just led to naturally like, okay, I might as well just be an avenue where the people can, can get them if I'm going to be like supporting, you know, the music oh, yeah. and all of that, might as well do that. So, yeah. I know, I know a lot of people that you've helped that have called me and told me that you've helped them and they were so grateful. I mean, you're, you do a lot for people that are going through mold and I thank you for that because people need people like you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the reminder, because I'll say that, you know, as you get better and we are getting better and I want to um, do a little plug for Keely with uh, Heal, Heal Better Now. Um, she is an herbalist and I didn't know anything about Chinese herbs and I really kind of still don't. I just know what Keely gives me. <laughs> and um, they've made a huge difference for me personally in the last few months. Um, I have just rapidly improved. Well, that combination of her and then also we, we addressed, we did the ceiling of the attic here in this current home um, that we had a bad negative air pressure problem in like pretty much almost everywhere here. And that those two things together have made such a tremendous difference as you get busy and can actually start living life again. You know, um, you, I have been maybe letting some of my mold stuff kind of go a little bit, <laughs> not as much, not, you know, completely, but it hasn't been the forefront in my life anymore because I'm actually able to go live life and, you know, life gets busy and whatever. So thank you for reminding me to make sure that I keep that a big focus because it is really important to me to help, help people going through that. It's a really lonely place for sure. Well, well thank you for coming on today and sharing your story. I truly appreciate it. And I hope that you do write a book about your journey because it is, it's a, it's one that should be told. It is a big journey. And in fact, I was actually thinking that I was going to ask Elizabeth to ghostwrite it for me. <laughs> she, she would probably do it. She's, she's a good writer. Should be oh, I, yeah. I, read, I read her little mole story and I was like, oh yeah, I think I'm going to ask her to ghostwrite my story. Okay. Elizabeth, you hear that? <laughs> Jennifer wants you to ghostwrite her. Elizabeth, I need you to ghostwrite my story. Although you're not going to be much of a ghostwriter because I just announced it on this Malachi's message video. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, she'd be a good one. Okay, well, thank you so but much. I'm going to write it myself. It will never happen. But if I, if I write it, there'll be a lot of grammar error. So Elizabeth even corrects my writing. Yeah, that too. I probably have a lot of run-on sentences for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I truly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all you guys do at Malachi's Message. <laughs>